Hello and welcome back to AmbiV. I'm Casper and today we're going to be taking a look at this 1978 Datsun 280Z I just bought and using it as an example of what you should check out on any new project car you start. So let's go ahead and see what we're starting with. So here we are with the 1978 Datsun 280Z I bought. This car was purchased specifically to be a new daily driver for me. Now, when you're buying a project, it's important to decide upfront what the purpose of the project is. The vast majority of the time when people end up in project car hell, it's because they can't decide what their project car is supposed to be. It's supposed to be a reliable daily driver, safe, that is fast and works on a racetrack and can haul kids, and can haul cargo, and you don't care if you take it to the mall and it gets door dings, but you're gonna show it on the weekends. Those are impossibilities. You cannot have a car that does everything. So you have to narrow it down. If you want a car that is okay in a lot of categories, do not spend 15 to $20,000 on a paint job. If you want a car that is a race car, don't spend any money on a paint job. The car doesn't matter. The whole car may be put into a wall your first time out and be thrown away. When dealing with the project like this, where I bought the car specifically to be a new daily driver, the considerations I made were, I want it to look decent, I want it to not rust, I want it to not already have too much damage because I'm going to try to preserve the car for a long time, and I want to be able to make it reasonably reliable and enjoyable. I knew already that I wanted my next daily driver to be another Z car because I don't get to drive my 240Z much now that it's essentially transitioned more into a weekend race car show car. So with this project in particular, I had to find the perfect donor vehicle to start with, which this base platform is quite good in that it came from the high deserts of Eastern Oregon, has virtually no rust, appears to have never been in an accident, is almost all original, the paint is flaking, but the paint actually still functioned to preserve the sheet metal, which is in excellent condition. And it was in mechanically sound enough condition for me to drive the three plus hours back to my shop. So that tells me the engine is relatively healthy, the drivetrain is relatively healthy, and the body is solid. Now, because this was a long-term ownership car, one of the problems you will have is people will maintain a car less the longer they have it and they are less likely to notice things that are going wrong with a car the longer they have it. As the, the suspension bushings start to wear out, as the struts die, people don't notice the grad gradual degradation of those systems, and so it just becomes an understood handling characteristic of the car. That is very much the case with this car. While they did say they did oil changes and they did regular maintenance, the first thing I noticed when I got in this car for the test drive was the fact that this car does not have decent steering bushings at all. The car, when you turn the wheel side to side, you can watch the entire rack and pinion slide side to side in the bushings because they're so worn. That translates to a very unique feeling when you're driving the car as when you enter a corner and begin to turn the wheels, for the first few moments, the wheels turning does not actually turn the vehicle because the whole steering rack is actually sliding so you're getting less of an actual response from the steering, at which point it eventually catches up, engages, and you get too much steering. So you have to realize that when you're dealing with a car that hasn't been maintained at 100%, there are going to be quarks. Now the difference between a quark like that, which makes it feel funny and makes me lose faith in the steering, that is different than a safety issue. The braking system on this car works. It works quite well, actually, for being this old system that hasn't been maintained. The suspension actually isn't too bad. Other than some clunks from some worn out components, it served its purpose. But I did find right off the bat several wires that had been chewed by a rodent, which could be the potential for a fire, especially one of the wires that happened to be coming directly from the battery, passing through no fusible links or fuses, and it was exposed right next to a frame rail that could most certainly cause a fire, especially if there's spilled oil or leaking oil anywhere near it. We also then have the issue 
of oil changes. When somebody tells you that they do regular oil changes and they've been taking care of the engine, you have to wonder why they don't talk about anything else. In the maintenance of an engine, you have oil changes, which are critical, but you also have coolant. You also have spark plugs, wires, cap, rotor. At least on a car this old, you'll have cap and rotor. On a more modern car, you'll have usually on plug coils. So you'll have an individualized coil for each spark plug. In that case, usually they need a little less maintenance because they're not a de de deliberate wear item. They don't actually have a mechanical component contacting. In this case, with a cap and rotor, if they haven't been maintaining that cap and rotor, it's been putting unnecessary strain on the wires, on the plugs, on the coil, on the supporting electrical system. So we need to go back through and essentially do maintenance archeology span on a project. So with this one, the very first thing I'm gonna start with is the things that I noticed while I was driving it So back. rather than having you watch me do spark plugs and wires and cap and rotor and basic maintenance, we'll go ahead and we'll just skip to it being complete. And now we have the project finished. So we have new wires on the spark plugs, we have the new cap and rotor in there, and we've begun diagnosing any other issues in the engine bay. One of the first things I noticed on this engine, and will be the case on most older cars that have a lot of wiring, this happens to be one of the earliest Z cars with fuel injection, is that a lot of the wires in the engine bay are quite brittle and corroded. Even being in a dry climate, corrosion is going to be a problem because there's coolant in the engine, there's also going to be some humidity in the engine bay when it's running, so there's always going to be issues. This wiring harness in particular, however, has a lot of heat cycling damage, probably related to being in the desert. So the plastic connectors that connect onto the fuel injectors, as well as the sensors for temperature and other readings to the computer, are so brittle that they've broken their tabs off that retain them. Some of them are so loose that I can simply pull them off, which these should be retained by metal clips. That is going to be a serious problem going forward. So the only real solutions to those are replacing that portion of the wiring harness with a new pigtail or replacing the wiring harness. This car has the option for an aftermarket fuel injection wiring setup that includes a new computer, new sensors, moves it over to more modern parts, but it's about $1,300. When I'm starting out a project, in general, I will start by making a spreadsheet of the known parts I need as well as the parts that I would like to have, and I will start to determine at what point the cost tips over to justifying paying for the more expensive maintenance items. So with this car, at $1,300 to replace all the electrical, I can buy a lot of sensors and pigtails before I get anywhere near that. And if I make that move, the one issue I have is it may actually negatively impact the value of the car because it will make it less original in case I need to sell it again. So moving forward for this phase, I'm going to do everything I can to preserve the original components. And then if I hit a complete stopping block, I will make the jump to the aftermarket systems. Okay, now that we have the spark plug wire, spark plugs and the cap and rotor replaced, we also dove into diagnosing a few other little issues here. So the wiring harness being brittle causes some of the connections to be poor, but we did notice that there was a random occurrence of the system running rich. So in addition to doing the basic items involved in generating spark for the ignition, you also need to be considering the fuel. The fuel injection system on these old cars in particular is very finicky and there's an optimal amount of pressure the system should have. So when dealing with this, there's basically three main components you're gonna have. You're going to have the fuel pump, which is pushing the fuel up to the front of the car. You're going to have a fuel filter, which is screening particulates out of the fuel. And then you're going to have a fuel pressure regulator, which is determining how much pressure to hold back. So in the case of this car, it's looking for around 30 PSI. The fuel factory service manual says 28 at idle and about 36 if you remove the vacuum source. So the way it's working is the vacuum draw on the fuel pressure regulator is causing it to change the pressure according to how much demand there is from the engine. That means that the 
injectors themselves didn't have to have as much variance as they would in a more modern car. You see that also in turbocharged applications, but essentially in the reverse. In this case, it's based on more vacuum, more fuel. In the case of a turbocharged car, it has to do with less vacuum or even boost generates more fuel pressure. That is just simply to help the injectors keep up with demand. Now I cut and spliced in an adapter here that gives me a fuel pressure gauge so that I could see what was happening. And that let me know two things. One, the fuel pressure was all over the place, but two, as soon as you turn the key off, all fuel pressure was lost. That shouldn't happen because the fuel pressure regulator should hold back a set amount of fuel for a period of time, as well as the fuel pump should hold a set amount of pressure. Because it failed so quickly, that told me that the system was bleeding through. And the most common problem for that is the fuel pressure regulator. So I replaced the fuel pressure regulator while we were here, put in this gauge so I could diagnose it, changed out the filter, because you should just assume that whoever has had the vehicle probably didn't do a filter unless you see a receipt for one. And then I also actually ended up putting in a fuel pump simply because I had one sitting over here from the Mustang project that was a great fit for this car. A little 255 Walboro is a good solution for this vehicle and it's actually quieter than the factory fuel pump when it's put into the place here. Once I've got the fuel system fairly well sorted out, the next consideration is what is the car actually running like? And this had periodic rich conditions. It would run way too rich. On a car like this, in particular the 280Z, it uses a Bosch fuel injection system where the most common reasons for it to run rich are the air meter, which it is actually an air meter, not a mass airflow sensor or a MAP sensor. An air meter, which is essentially a flappy door that tells it how much air is coming in. The Throttle position sensor, which does exactly as it's described, tells the computer what the position of the throttle is in, or the coolant temperature sensor. Well, after cleaning those up and taking a look at them, we quickly figured out that we had a problem with the coolant temperature sensor. Now this car has three coolant temperature sensors, or at least three variants of something very similar to a coolant temperature sensor. So the one that actually needed to be replaced is the smaller unit that actually feeds a signal back to the computer to tell it how warm the engine is to allow it to know whether to enrich in the mix or not. Another sensor it has is also a two wire sensor, but much larger. This one serves another purpose. I believe this one actually is only for the gauge in the dash, but it could also be feeding another set of systems. When I was diagnosing the issue, I simply took the smaller sensors plug and jumped it with a piece of wire which made it think that it was wide open and the engine was warm. Everything ran great. So I knew immediately that was the problem. So a quick trip down to the parts store and we have a replacement. Now in addition to this sensor I have broken or extremely brittle plugs on every sensor and every fuel injector. So I will go through and clean all of those with contact cleaner and just try to generally make sure they're as tight as possible. If I end up replacing the, few, the harness, this will solve the problem. But in the meantime, what I may do to buy time is use tiny zip ties to hold the connector tight, simply so that it can't vibrate its way off with the broken clips. In the future, I would like to replace this entire harness with a more modern harness that also uses more modern fuel injectors and more modern sensors. But that'll be it for a later video. Other than the top side of the engine, you need to do the basic drivetrain. So now that we've taken care of the engine as far as all the basic maintenance and getting it running well, you have your transmission back to your differential. So as a basic maintenance item, I always change the oil on every car I get, regardless of when the previous owner says that they changed it last. I also typically change the transmission fluid, which I've already done on this one. You'll notice it's kind of greasy looking because I've sprayed it down with cleaner. So this has been changed as well as the differential fluid. Typically people forget about the transmission of the differential until they start to cause problems. 
And that problem is usually quite expensive compared to maintenance. So transmission fluid, differential, pretty much guarantees. Once I'm under the car here, I can also check out all the other maintenance items. The grease fittings, the drive lines grease fittings, all of these look like they probably haven't been done in a while, so I went ahead and greased all the fittings. Up front, you can tell that most of the bushings are shot, especially the bushings holding in the steering rack and the bushings out on the outside of the control arms. So I will be probably replacing the control arms or at least rebuilding them. I will be replacing the brake lines that look like they're pretty dry rotted. And I will be working my way through this system as I have time and money. But I will be hitting items that are either critical to reliability or safety first. So brakes will be being evaluated really early on and so will the steering bushings. That concludes our tour of the maintenance items on this car and discussion of general maintenance items for your project car. This car now has new plugs, new wires, distributor cap, rotor. It has new oil. The fluids have been all checked. We've changed the fluid in the transmission and in the differential. I've lubed all of the grease fittings that I could find under the car. I've checked the coolant in the radiator. I've fixed every vacuum line I could find that was cracked or disconnected. I've cleaned up as many of the connectors as possible and even replaced the coolant temp sensor. So this car is now running really well. I will continue to replace things including bushings and the brakes as I go down the maintenance list. But for this video, that is the conclusion and I will get back to work. So thank you all for watching and I'll see you in the next video.